If you want to click the slideshow link up at the top right, yeah, that'll um, that'll give you, yeah, that'll make it the presentation view. Okay. So first, uh, I just uh, would like to introduce uh, some some background and aims of my current project. So the title of my project is accelerating the Parkinson diagnosis using multiple mixed data and artificial intelligence. In this project, we have two aims. The first one is systematically to find the genes that are associated with the PD diagnosis. Uh, in the M1, we have uh, three uh, small steps. The first one is discovering the genes from uh, the PPMI cohort, then do the uh, replication in another two cohorts, the PDBP and BioFind. Then we will also evaluate the blood-based PD biomarkers, or the different repair genes in our brain data. Uh, the second aim is to uh, build a classifier for the PD diagnosis. We will use our uh, we will use the discovered differential repair gene as the predictor, and uh, also the classifier will be built on the PPMI and evaluated on the PDP and BioFind. So all the data are from the MPPD project, uh, uh, which includes the gene pricing, the genetic data, and the, also the clinical data. And here is a study outline of my current project. First, uh, we, we, should, we, we will discover, uh, uh, we will uh, do the differentially expressed gene analysis using on the discovery data set, it is the PPMI data set, then we will find the we will find the DGs and uh, use the DGs to build a diagnosis classifier. And we will also do the DG analysis on the replication data set, which means the PDBP and BioFind, and uh, replicate the discovered DGs in the, in the replication data set. And uh, we'll use the replicated gene to do the enrichment analysis to find the uh, underlying functions of the uh, replicated DEGs. And then we will build the, the classifier based on the differential pressure gene or use all the genes to remove the uh, the bias of the of the of, of the cohort like that. And uh, uh, to make uh, to make our classifier without the cohort on specificity, we also combined all these three cohorts to build the classifier on 80% of this uh, whole data set as a training and uh, to do the testing on the leave out 20%. So here is the first step. We needed to do some uh, simple filtration to remove those samples that uh, not meet our requirement. Uh, this is here. I just uh, show the process on our discovery data set. So first, uh, we need to remove those samples without the RNA seq data. And uh, in in my current stage, I only focus on the baseline data. So we need to uh, only keep those. Or we need to remove those samples without uh, the baseline data. And also, the renamer. If, if the renamer is too small, it means the uh, data quality is is worse, so we need to remove those samples. Also, we need to filter out those non-case control samples, and also uh, the white race participant occupies uh, uh, over ninety percent of the participants. So we only kept the white race participant. So finally, after the filtration steps uh, in the PPMI data set. We have 691 case samples and uh, 502 control samples. And also the same same filtration step were applied to the uh, PDPP and BioFind data set. And uh, it, this is our replicated data set. So finally, we have 812 case PD cases and uh, 530 control samples. So let me go to the Terra notebook to see the data process code. 
So here is the workspace for my project and some brief introduction and the data, data links and the links to my notebooks. And here's my notebook. So here I have six notebooks. So according, according to my uh, data process steps. So the first one is to prepare the participant and the RNC, RNC simple data. The first part, so this notebook is just to demonstrate how to access the MPPD clinical data and the RNC data. And uh, the first step just uh, load the uh, re required libraries. Oh, so this is the Python code. I, I use the Python code to do the uh, data process. Mm, the first part uh, load the required libraries and uh, predefine some utility functions and uh, set up uh, the global uh, variant that will be used in the following code. So the first step, I just uh, do the big query. So the data uh, stored in the Google uh, Google Cloud platform, uh, we can use the big query uh, to search the data tables. So here I just uh, uh, query to all the uh, clinical data tables of the MPPD data set. So here we can see there are 30, 36 tables. These are all the uh, clinical data information, data tables. And also here is a useful link that we can uh, just uh, go to the Google Cloud platform to see this, to see these tables here. Yeah, like this. And the next step, here we have so many tables. I just needed to uh, select the useful columns, the useful features, and uh, combine them into one big table. So here is the steps. I defined a SQL sentence here and uh, to combine the eight tables and uh, just uh, extract uh, the useful columns, the useful features such as the participant ID and the diagnosis and the UPDRS scores and the ring number and the which study does this sample come from and uh, merge them into one table. So here is the uh, columns in my table. So here you can see I have 31 columns that extracted from eight tables. So uh, this, the first part is for the uh, I six samples. So the, this part is to build the uh, information table about the participant. So you can see I combined the three tables and uh, extracted the participant ID, uh, the sex, uh, age, and the race information and, and the case control status. So I here I, I just received the information into two files, the simple info and the participant info. And also I, I made a, a folder on the server to save these files. So you can see I use, we can exact, we can, do, we can run the bash, uh, the bash command to just uh, list uh, the files in my workspace. Here is the uh, saved information, the participant info and the simple info uh, on, in the data folder. So uh, when I uh, doing this, I found one, uh, one uh, issue is that, so for actually for each participant, there should be only one record in my participant info. But uh, uh, actually when I check the, uh, check the data in this file, I found uh, one participant may have several, several, several rows in the, in the file because uh, when 
there are some duplicated information such as the age at the baseline or the age at the diagnosis, the changes during the vi during visits. So I need to merge the, uh, the the ages or the duplicated information for uh, each participant. So here is the code. We can I just uh, process the duplicated information. And uh, so finally, uh, I found there are uh, 3,274 unique participants. And here I also count the times of the visit of each participant. It means how many I think samples for each participant. And finally, I write all this uh, information into uh, one file. I uh, add uh, the unique ID in the file name. So here you can see here is my uh, final participant info table and uh, records how many uh, mm, with the suffix n it means uh, how um, how many uh, records or the count of the records that appears in for this feature and uh, I plotted a bar plot a histogram to show uh, the visit, the count of the visit. It means how many uh, people, how many participants has just only one visit and uh, how many participants have five visits or four visits. And here just uh, listed, just uh, uh, listed the uh, uh, ages. It means such as for the first one, it means there are, uh, 57 participant at the age 62. Yeah, here's the first part. Just uh, to prepare the participant and uh, the uh, RI sync simple data. Um, before you continue, are you able to zoom in just a little bit um, into the the Terra workspace? Like, can you zoom your browser just the okay? To make to make the front a uh, little bigger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that would be helpful. It's uh, yeah. big on my screen because I have a pretty big screen, but yeah. other people who are on laptops might have issues seeing. Yeah, let me let me try. How to set it? Uh, let me go to the. Yeah, there should be a zoom plus minus on the. Oh no, just go back. Go back. Page you were. Oh, on. okay. Oh, I, I see here. Yeah, there should be a zoom in. What yeah. about what about this side? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that looks good to me. I think it looks good. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank okay. you. Yeah. So the first the first notebook is just to prepare the participant and I think uh, samples. And uh, so for my project, uh, I only to focus on the baseline data. It means I only need the uh, I think data at the first visit because I wanted to try to find the uh, uh the the pd the pd diagnosis biomarkers at an early stage we do not uh currently we do not consider the visit the, the further visit we only focus on the first visit so the first one the second step is to extract the baseline data so it is it is same uh, for the for the few steps in this notebook just load the library the predefined functions and the predefined the predefined the global variables, and this, from this step, uh, we will we will need the uh, files prepared in the first notebook. So we load the simple we load the simple information, and load the uh, mutation information. Actually, this is uh, not necessary uh, in my current project, but I just uh, added this information here. And the cohort information and the enrollment information, and also load my the prepared the the participant information prepared in the first notebook, and then we just print out how many are anything samples. And uh, here is the summary of the participant number and the uh, RNA sample info. 
Yeah, actually, uh, uh, in my test, I use the PPMI as the example. Here is a PDF. Here, this this variable just like a switch. You can, uh, you can you can you can replace the PDF with the PPMI. Or here it shows if the uh, if the study equals to PDF, it means we will working on the PDBP and biofinding set. If the study equals to the PDBP, we only work on the PDBP data set. Or the PBB means the we work on the uh, the three cohort. By default, it will we will work on the PVMI data set. And just uh, print some information about the data size and uh, remove this this step just uh, removes those samples that without uh, the RNC data and only keeps the uh, baseline samples. It means the visit amount should be equal to zero or equal to zero point five, and print the number of the uh, RNC uh, the size of the I seek baseline data. And here why I should add this part. Uh, for some uh, participant, they do not have the baseline data. So we checked their uh, first available I seek data. And uh, we, we can see here uh, for those for those participant without uh, the baseline data we use the earliest visit. Uh, it means we added this fifteen uh, participant in our uh, data set, even though they do not have the uh, baseline data, but they have the six months visit data. But for the twelve one, we do not use it. So finally, in after this step, we have. 1,689 participants. And uh, further, we need to remove those, we need to remove those samples with lower ring, uh, ring value. Yeah, and only keep the white race participant and uh, only keep the case control samples. Yeah, here just to print the the numbers, and after each filtration, and uh, divide the uh, samples into case samples and control samples, and we also require uh, there's no changes during the visit. It means the case control uh, at the latest uh, should be always case or should it be always control it means that the latest uh, is equal uh, is the same as the baseline so it means there's no changes during the visit and the way just save save the uh, cleaned participant into a file it means all, all, all cases and all controls that can be used for the next step in, in our analysis, one important uh, feature is the uh, duration of the disease. It means how long uh, the uh, the patient, the PD, the PDKs, have been diagnosed diagnosed as the uh, as the patient as a PD patient. So in this step, we need to uh, we need two information. The first information is the age at uh, baseline and the age at the diagnosis. So the age at the baseline minus the age at the diagnosis, we will have the duration of the disease. But for the age at the baseline, there are maybe multiple records, such as for the age at the baseline, uh, for one person, there should be recorded 20, 30, or 40. Uh, in my uh, process, I just use the earliest age as the age of the diagnosis. And also there may be some uh, some participants without this value. I just labeled this as NA. 
Yeah, and uh, th this function, this process, just used to calculate it, just just used to calculate the duration of disease. Yeah, after after the, after that, we need to just to uh, to extract the uh, useful columns, the useful uh, features that will be used for the following analysis, and uh, save the final result to a new file. So for each step, I kept the uh, I save the data into a file. There may be some redundancy. But uh, for me, I it is it, it, I think it is good to track the uh, the filtration steps to track the data uh, in my analysis. Yeah. So this is the second uh, notebook just used to extract the uh, baseline data and uh, to calculate the duration of disease for the participant. So after dealing with the uh, 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 clinical data, the third notebook is focused on the RNA-seq data. Same process, load load the library and the uh, function, and define the uh, global variables. And here also, I prepared some links that can be used to go to the Google Cloud platform to check the uh, data tables, the transcriptomics data. So I will not show here. And uh, each link can be can be collected to, to see the data table on Google Cloud the platform. And here, uh, uh, I would like to point out is that uh, the ISIC data was uh, stored in a long table uh, on the Google Cloud platform. I I tried to use the BigQuery function to read the table directly from the Google Cloud, but uh, it takes a long time to load the to load the table. So actually, uh, I download the data to my local machine and uh, uh, transferred the long table to a wide table. So after after I do the transformation, I uploaded the wide table to my to, to this workspace. So here I just read the uh, data from the transferred from the wide table I prepared. Yeah, here is the uh, so this table is for uh, the read count, read count data from the Simon quantification files result, and uh, this file is the uh, TPM file, uh, also from the Simon quantification result. Yeah, and just load the, this step. Just load the load the data into the gene read data frame and the gene TPM data frame. Here, just to print out the, uh, the, uh, the first number is the number of genes. It means the number of rows. And the uh, second number is the number of the samples, is a simple size in number of columns. Yeah. And uh, uh, so in my uh, second notebook, I uh, felt out, I extracted the baseline simple so i just read in the baseline simple uh, data and uh, use use this use the data in the uh, use the participant in the uh, baseline to extract the read data and uh, the tpm data so here you can see here is the baseline data and uh, use the functions to extract the baseline samples. So you, here you can see only 1,347 samples were kept compared to this one. 
So the gene, the gene number does not change, but the number of the samples uh, will only keep the for the uh, baseline data, baseline participant. Yeah, here's the third step. So after the extraction of the RNA-seq data, we needed to check the data qualities. So this one, I so for the data quality uh, for the quality control process, uh, uh, I used this is the this is the us. I use R to do the R language R script to do this QC process and just uh, load the required libraries and uh, define which data set we work on. Here you can just re replace the PDBF to PVMI or to to the PVB or other prefix. You can change the data set you, are, you will work on and read the uh, read count data and the TPM data and the uh, clinical data. Yeah, here just uh, to make sure to make sure uh, uh, the the order in the uh, read count table read count table or the TPM table is the same as the clinical table because. Uh, for many R functions, match the samples, uh, use the order. Yeah, we just uh, do some check. And uh, for some lowly expressed gene, such as the gene, the gene with only five reads, that uh, with less than five reads in more than 90 percent of samples i will remove those samples only keep the uh only keep the genes with uh relatively higher expression levels and also also remove those uh, genes with lower variance only keep the genes with a variance greater than one so here you can see before before the uh, gene filtration we have more than 58,000 genes, but after the filtration, we only have about uh, 31,000 genes. And do the RE plot to check if there are some outliers. Yeah, for this part of this, uh, yeah, let me select it. This part is to do the RE RLE plot and uh, label the participant with the with the uh, PD conditions, sex, or the plate number. And the, uh, this part is just a zoom in the uh, right side, 100. Right, most of the 100 samples are on the most right side. So here we can see the, the RLE plot. This is labeled by the PD conditions, and uh, this is labeled. The color represents the sex, and uh, here the color represents the plant number. And uh, so, for the 100 samples on the right side, we zoom in to check their, uh, how can I say, their uh, variance. Yeah. Actually, the the RSEQ data quality is is really good and we didn't remove any uh, uh, samples from the RNA-seq data check process and then we also do the clustering this this step also uh, used to, to check the outer layers so from this process we we didn't we we don't think there is an extreme outer layer This is for D statistic. The D statistic is you can uh, you can treat it like a, a method to to measuring the distance or to measuring the correlation between the samples. So here it's just the bar plot source, uh, the histogram source, the distribution, 
of the dystatic values. And maybe this one can be maybe we we can we can set a cutoff. Maybe the zero point eight can be a cutoff, and these three the not 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 really three. Maybe these symbols uh, on the left side can be treated as the outer layer, but uh, mm, I I kept them. I don't think they are really extreme. The the extreme outer layer in my analysis, and the the gender check to check if the self report gender is matched with the genetic gender. I used uh, one gene from the chromosome X and one gene from the chromosome Y. And we can see uh, these two groups are separately very well. So it means there's, there's no mismatch between the uh, clinical self-reported gender and uh, the genetic, uh, genetic gender. And we also do the PCA. This is this is called all four PCA. It's a little complex, and also we do PCA on the top five hundred variance variance gene. Yeah, we can see here they are mixed. The kids can true and mixed them together, cannot be separated very well. Yeah, and uh, colored by gender, they are also mixed together. So we only keep the white race, so there is only one color. Yeah, this is for the uh, top 500 genes with uh, the highest, uh, with the largest uh, variance. It is also mixed. Yeah. And for after after all the data have been prepared and uh, the data quality have been checked. The next step is to do the differential extra gene analysis. This is the most important, the first step in my uh, analysis in my project. So in this in this notebook, I also used the R, the R script because there are, I use the D6, D6 2 to do the differential extra analysis. The D6 2 is a R package, the R package. So I. This notebook is the is R notebook. So to uh, install or to load the packages, the tidyverse and pkdmf and some other required uh, packages. Yeah. Define the global functions and the predictive functions. And also to define which data set you will work on is just like a switch. You can change the you can change the data set here. And load the data and uh, to to match the orders and uh, do the filtration like the uh, data queue system. So here it shows uh, how the data number changes during the uh, filtration. Yeah, this number is the same as the QC step. And here is to load the read count data and into the D6 functions. So here in my analysis, uh, the D6 requires uh, the read count data, and uh, the read count data should be an integer. So I use the round function to 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 uh, make the read count read count data to be an uh, integer. And uh, also uh, the covariance table, it means the, the data table we prepared in the notebook three. And uh, I also added the duration of disease, the age, the sex, the platinum number as the covariance in the uh, D differential averaging analysis. And here is the uh, step to do the to run the d 2 but it takes a, a very long time to run it so i comment this and i just uh, uh, uploaded my, the result that uh, from for my local i have run i have got a result in my local it, it may take so for the for the data size 
there are 31,000 genes for one, for 1,000 participants. It may take uh, maybe six to eight hours to run. So here I just uploaded my result here. And then here we can check the result of the first column in the gene ID and the, the log to further change the p values and adjust the p values and the uh, gene symbols and the gene types and the location of the gene. So the next step is to plot the result. The most common plot is the volcano plot and we can see here. Mm. Yeah, this is a p-value cutoff. This is the photo change cutoff. So there's no genes past uh, the uh, photo change cutoff. Yeah, so yeah, the, here is used the y-axis. Uh, the y-axis is used FDR, and the second uh, uh, plot I use the raw p the nominal p-value as the uh, y-axis. And this, then I need to run the DSIG on the replication data set. So the first step uh, here, the first step here it should be the here it should be the PPMI, and then I run the D six two on PD PDBF and PDBP and bell find the set, load load the data. It is the it is the same process as the previous as running on PPMI data set. This is the result table and save save the result. Yeah, making the plot like the volcano plot. So after after running on the PBMI data set and the PDBF data set, we needed to find uh, those replicated genes. So here is just to find the significant gene in PBMI and the significant gene in PDBF and uh, to, 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 to extract the intersection of these two data set and uh, define as the replication, replicated genes. Yeah, here is the result table. And uh, then the, uh, the replicated genes uh, may have different changing directions. So here, just plot uh, the genes if they have the same change direction. So the uh, y-axis is the discover the gene the log to full change of the genes in the discovery data set, and the x-axis is the log to full change in the of the genes in the discovery data set. So we can see only the green dot. Each dot is a gene. Means they they are um, means they are uh, significant genes in both discovery and replication set and also have the same chain direction but for the gray dot although they are significant in both data set but uh, they have different chain directions so the green dot is what we want so we use the green dot in the, the, the genes of the green dot and uh, to do the enrichment analysis and I use the cluster profiler as the, uh, to do this enrichment analysis. Just load, load the data, load the library, load the data. Yeah, here is the loaded data. So oh, only the protein coding, only the protein coding gene were kept to do the enrichment analysis. So I run the uh, enrich gene ontology on the BP on BP uh, BP means the biological process and uh, the GOCC cellular components and uh, the uh, geomolecular function to find the enriched terms in these three category. Also, I uh, checked the if the genes enrich. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Mm -hmm. Also, I do enrichment in the KEGG 
KGG data set. And uh, here, uh, which one? I see. Which this part? Oh, this part just uh, show the genes and the mapped the mapped entries ID because in in the KGG they require the entries ID as an input. And here just uh, plot the result. Here we can see uh, the enriched uh, geontology biological process. So we can see there are some. Uh, um, um, there's some immune, immune response. It means the replicated gene have played some important role in the immune response processes and does the uh, look side degranulation. And also the enriched cellular components like the a lot of granule and membranes. So it means uh, these genes have important roles in the granules or in the uh, memory is part of the cell. And there's no enriched molecular function and uh, some enriched uh, uh, KGG pathways. Yeah, yeah here's the, here's the uh, DG part and the enrichment analysis part. And the, for the last part is uh, to build the PG diagnosis classifier. Um, it's a six. Yeah, here uh, I'm more familiar with Python. So, uh, besides the notebook, the notebook four and the notebook five, I use R. So, for other uh, four notebooks, I use Python. Yeah, load load the function, load the packages, and the defined functions, and predefine the global variables. And here I define a lasso function for feature selection. Yeah. Define the variables. The model I use is the logic logistic regression. You can change you can change the model to random forest right here. You can change to to random forest or to SVM or to the SGD or gradient boosting classifier. You can you can just uh, set the models to different uh, values to select different classifier. Yeah. And uh, the data set we work on is the PPMI and uh, the uh, uh, case, case versus control and the user lasso as a feature selection uh, method and to uh, define the folders in the means where to save our result and to load the data. So uh, the train, uh, the PPMI we used as the uh, training set and the PDBS used as the testing data set. If we use all genes or we just um, we just use the uh, uh, differentially expressed genes, here just count the number of genes we used to load the data. Here is the read, here is the defined data and here is the read data and define the label. In the case, uh, we, we define PD case as the as one and uh, the controls as zero. So here is the training data site, data site, uh, the, the data size of the training data set and uh, the testing data set. And we do do the lasso feature selection. So here, finally, we only uh, Select in this example. I in, in the in this notebook, I used the differential repression gene uh, as the features. After the feature selection, uh, only thirty-two gene was selected as the final uh, input predictor. Yeah, here the define the cross validation. I use the five fold cross validation and. Uh, here select one model so in this step i use the logistic in this notebook i used the, the logistic regression you can change the models and predefine some variables to store the performance 
uh, values. So here, just uh, run the model and uh, to get the performance value, performance goals of the model. Yeah, the AUC value on the uh, test dataset on the training dataset like this. Yeah, and the plot uh, the performance goals. Here it just shows the result. It shows the uh, the performance of the logistic regression on the training data set on the testing data set, and uh, here oh, here is the 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 shadow is the one standard deviation, and uh, this is the AUC uh, the area under the receive operation. Curve and uh, here is the precision recall curve. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so here I only used the transcriptomic data to build the classifier, and uh, uh, I'm still working on this part. And uh, uh, I added the genetic variance and the clinical information into my uh, model, and the performance improved a lot. Yeah, and we also build some. Uh, advanced model such as the using the deep learning the autoencoder to to build the classifier and uh, uh, we hope we can get uh, more advanced and more accurate we, we can improve our performance a lot yeah that's it thank you So I had a question for you. You um, you mentioned that you used um, R uh, for a couple of your notebooks because you had um, because you needed to use the DC package. Yeah. Are yeah. You, for the others, um, did you just use Python because you're more familiar with it, or were there packages that were only available? Uh, uh, actually, I'm more familiar with Python. Uh, I can write R. I can write Python, but uh, I'm I use Python often. I use Python more. There are okay yeah yeah i i appreciate that i'm uh, much more familiar with python yeah yeah so python will be my first choice so if the dc2 is the uh, if the dc2 is a python package i think for the notebook five i will use python too <laughs> okay yeah thanks mm. Uh, I can't hear. I can't hear you. Ah, thank you. Were okay, there any okay. other questions that people had um, prior to moving on? I know we're at time, so um, I guess if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to speak them out or share them. Um, also, we do have our survey, so um, I did paste the link at the top. Uh, let me repaste that. So if you could please fill out your, um, if you could fill it out, it would really help us out. Um, so if you could take the five minutes to do it, that would be really helpful. Um, and then if you had, I think there there is an area where you can add additional comments. If there were any questions you had about today that didn't get answered, please feel free to put them in there or just reach out to me directly. Um, so like I said, we will be scheduling something in July. So just look out for an email for that because that is not currently scheduled. Um, and the August 10th one um, is in the books, but it's not, um, it's not, uh, I haven't sent out the invite for it yet. Um, and then just to uh, answer this question in the, um, in the chat. So we're working on figuring out a way to upload this um, in a more public setting. It's currently available in the AMP PD um, shared folder, uh, which is, I guess, it has restricted access. So if you have access to that AMP PD folder, if you're part of any AMP PD working groups, then you should have access to this. If you don't have access to the AMP PD um, folders or Google Drives, uh, we are working on a way of getting this um, so that people can access the, the recordings. Could you say anything more about the AMP PD working groups? 
are those like already said, or is there any opportunity to get involved in one of those? So those are, um, so this is actually a slide of a lot of the, of the data oh, knowledge of the okay. working groups. Um, so there's co-chairs, it's the working groups are made up of people that are um, in the, the initial slide. So if I just come all the way back here, um, so it's all the partners of MPD um, hmm. that are making up those working groups. Um, so, yeah, I think, I don't know if they're set. I don't know if you're in one of these um, contributor spaces. Um, if you are um, and you're interested in joining the working groups, I think you could probably reach out to um, whoever on your team is already part of a working group. You could see if um, that, if you could potentially be added, but I'm not sure exactly how that would go. Um, just because that's not, I, I just do the data analysis. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, but I can, I can ask and get back to you. Um, but yeah, um, so yeah, uh, this is the, this is not the complete list, but this is, I guess, most people that are involved in the MPD project. And it really is a huge group effort among multiple sites, um, you know, and multiple, um, contributors. So special thanks to all the country, all the contributors. Um, the study participants, and especially the the community members who um, are contributing to the workspaces as well. Um, and with that, thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. You can also email the admin at MPD um, email. Um, and then, like I said, the easiest way for you to um, express your opinions about the webinar um, and things that you would find useful are directly through the survey. Um, so that would be really great if you could take a few minutes to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, were there any questions um, before we say goodbye? I, I actually just had a quick question about um, the yes. cloud environment that you used on that uh, in your workspace there. Um, and just like, yeah, what kind of um, CPU and um, like disk storage that you're using and kind of like, if there were greater costs associated when you're doing your um, AI work, I, I just haven't done any of that yet, so I wasn't sure what kind of impact that had on on those things and and time that it took to run those. So for me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Actually, he was asking for the for the notebooks what your cloud environment set up. Yes, uh, actually, uh, when when you are set up a workspace, uh, you can customize how many CPUs and how many storage spaces you you want to use. Uh, actually, I have the same concern with you, as you as you have. So when I uh, running the maybe the such as the deep learning models, if if the cloud can support this. Uh, uh, I haven't tried. So um, when I was running through, when I cloned this workspace and ran through it, um, I ended up doing eight CPUs and 52 gigs of memory. Um, and it costs about 50 cents per hour um, to run uh, $2 a month of disk costs and uh, one cent per hour for pause cloud compute costs. Um, I've run other workspaces where it's less and it it does calculate it out for you as you click stuff. Yeah. And then Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure if like doing the AI stuff you needed the greater CPUs or not or if it was just like if you pretty much you know can run it like anything else. Yeah, so when I was running these, I needed to up the CPUs and the memory. Um I started out with two like my standard is two and 13 and that's what i usually use and it works for most things um this one i had to up it a little bit um i think yeah i got like a like a kernel error like a kernel dying stopping or something error um and i yeah. upped i upped it to eight and was it 52 whatever yeah. Whatever it was earlier, um, and it it worked and it ran through. Um, cool. So, uh, yes, the, uh, the cost isn't that much more in terms of per hour, but I guess if you're multiplying it, you know, if it goes from ten cents to fifty cents per hour, that is like a fivefold 
increase in cost. Um, so, but I think you could probably get away with a little bit less. Yeah, actually, the 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 cloud, the cloud platform supported the GPU, and uh, but the cost will be high. And uh, uh, when you are loading a uh, uh, big size file, sometimes the terminal book will will die. Yeah, I'm just going to X out of this because I don't want to update my environment. But yeah, and then when you stop it, it, it still charges um, you for even the paused time. So if you clone a workspace and you don't want it anymore, you can just, I don't know if there's ways of getting around getting charged that kind of paused. So it, it will, uh, when it's paused, it won't charge you for the compute engine anymore, um, yeah. but the disk space. Uh, you'll still get charged for the persistent disks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I don't think there's a way around that. Yeah. The default of the persistent disk is is like fifty gigabytes or something. I was just looking at this today. And does it? Yeah. Make sense to like decrease that? I I mean, is that's typically? Can you like just run over that super quickly? Is that just kind of like? If you have a lot of things that you're storing longer term, that's where it goes, or or in the workspace uh, that you need so, like. So that's for that's the persistent disk for the uh, the virtual machine that's going to be running the code. Um, so that's only that would only be for whatever files are created um, or downloaded while you're running the notebook. Mm, okay. Okay. So generally, if if we're um, if we're going to be keeping something long term, um, uh, we'll run the notebook and then we'll upload it to a, a Google Cloud storage bucket. Um, partly because it's it's uh, a bit cheaper than the persistent disk, um, but also it's it's more permanent. Um, the uh, the cloud environments uh, differ from. Um, one billing project to another and from one workspace to another. Um, so generally we try and just use just use a persistent disk while we're actually running uh, and then upload any outputs to um, GCS. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Were there any other questions before we sign off? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you to our presenter. That was incredibly useful. And I don't know, the visualizations were really cool. I always really like graphs and visualizations. So that made me really excited. Um, so I think that was like my favorite part. Um, but yeah, no, really, really outstanding work. Um, just a lot of work that went into to designing this and building it out and getting the code going. So thank you so much for, you know, doing it, but also sharing it with us. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you. OK. Well, okay. Uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Talk to you guys later. Bye.